Hey, my name is Thomas and today I've got something <laughs> super special for you. Uh, this is a Rollerflex SL66 SE. This is the last model of the most spectacular mechanical, all mechanical 6x6 camera ever made by Rollei. And what's even more spectacular is that this particular camera is uh, owned by a Cologne-based photographer, Philip Bösel. He gave me this camera so I can make this review. Many thanks. and. Um, Philip did a cool photo project in the 1980s using a Roller Flex SL66 camera and I'm also going to tell you more about that. So I'm super excited, let's have a go! The Rollerflex SL66 uh, model range was launched in 1966. Uh, remember that back in the 1950s, actually, uh, Victor Hasselblad and um, Heidecker from uh, the company that makes uh, these uh, cameras, they had sort of a gentleman's agreement. Rollei would only make twin lens reflex cameras, Hasselblad would only make single lens reflex cameras. But in the 60s it became apparent that single lens was the future and twin lens, they were really losing market share. So this gentleman's agreement uh, had to come to a halt and uh, Rollei launched this camera. It was basically developed to beat the Hasselblad in every conceivable uh, manner. Uh, they really try to outperform Hasselblad in everything, make the camera that's just <laughs> just even better. So the first SL66 launched in 66, made until the mid 80s and then came the 66E and the SE models. They had a light meter and the SE even a spot meter. Uh, the last were made around 1992. This camera has a, a built-in light meter and a spot meter, but I didn't get a battery for it because I'm so used to shooting these 6x6 cameras with external light meter or using Sony 16. So, sorry, I can't tell you anything about how good the light meter works. I'm just shooting at f5.6 and 2 50th of a second handheld. typical Rollei crank back and forth. So, the Rollerflex SL66 is a completely modular system camera, just like the Hasselblad 500 series or 200 uh, series. That means you've got interchangeable film back. Uh, the camera body with a shutter in it, it's got a uh, focal plane shutter, contrast to the 500 Hasselblad, and then of course interchangeable lenses and interchangeable viewfinders. So this is the most compact layout that you can have, uh, just a waist level finder and the standard 18mm lens. Everything else will make the camera much more bulky and heavy, uh, and it is already very heavy, I have to say. Um, the shutter runs all speeds up to one thousandth of a second. That was the reason why uh, Rollerflex wanted to have a, a focal plane shutter instead of a leaf shutter built into the lens, uh, because then you only got five hundredths of a second. Um, mark, 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 mark. <laughs> The disadvantage is it uh, flash synchronization is very, very slow, only 30th of a second. So if you plan to shoot with a flash, this camera is absolutely not ideal. Uh, on this side, you've got the focusing mechanism. And now you see the specialty of the Wallaflex. You see, you've got a huge 
I mean it, a huge focus throw. There's a built-in bellows, uh, and now this lens is basically in the macro range. Uh, and the other super peculiar feature of this camera is that you can also tilt the lens up and down by about 8 degrees. Uh, I think it's the only 6x6 system camera that has this feature built into the camera. So the tilting works with every lens. And apart from that, here goes your flash. Hot shoe. Uh, here you can switch between spot meter and uh, the normal average metering. Again, I don't have a battery in the camera. Battery goes in here. I didn't get a battery because I'm so used to shoot them without batteries. Sorry, guys. Um, lens unmounts here. Next peculiar thing. Okay, now I've got a filter on it, but actually you can mount the lens in reverse for super macro shots. Remember, uh, if you want to use the light meter, you have to set the speed of the film here, because every film back can have a different film in it, of course. That's the point of interchangeable backs. On the bottom, tripod mount. Because it's a square format, you only need this one mount. Uh, if you're shooting 4.5 by 6, of course, then you have to think of a solution if you want to shoot like this. And um, this thing is the uh, mirror pre-release. You need this if you're on a tripod to avoid the mirror slap uh, blurring your photos. And this thing is to um, go to stop down mode so you can check when you step down go like this then you see uh, you see the image I will show it to you in the detail later and you see the actual image that changes with the aperture if you want to have it in the normal mode open aperture mode it's here then it's automatic aperture I think that's it with the features a lot of features as you see oh and I forgot something on this ring here, because this is the focus ring, you set the um, focal length of your lens so that these scales work accordingly. So, as you see, a lot of mechanical excellence was built into this camera. This is really a masterpiece. If you like cameras like this, if you enjoy super complex mechanical things and super high craftsmanship, it won't get better than this. By the way, I really love the super, super precise and very, very bright focusing screen in this thing. Of course, the screen is also interchangeable. Uh, I'm not even sure if these interchange with the ones from the twin lens reflex or reflex cameras, but having such a great screen uh, yeah, gives such a super high precision feeling when focusing. And it's just awesome uh, to see the world through this screen. Fantastic. Okay, now we are loading the camera, which is always a hassle. You take out this. And uh, normally you don't do it in the sunlight. Exchange the spools. Now you can use this cogwheel here. And this is when you start to pray that it catches the film. Yay, it works! This arrow has to line up with that arrow. So you turn it a little bit like this. Now we are ready fiddle it in, pay attention to the small cogwheels here. Close. This has to be... Now you turn this. 
click there you see a small one push that in click this is cocked ready to shoot very important small feature is this uh, you can lock the shutter button as you see the shutter button is kind of exposed here uh, so it's easy to accidentally trip the shutter. Of course, I always forget to lock the shutter button, so in every film I will have at least one blank exposure. Uh, so I tend to not wind on the film, just uh, I wind only when I really shoot the next photo. But you can lock it. So back in uh, the 1980s, Philip Bösel, uh, Colombe's photographer, made a project. It was called Die Vermessung der Mauer, uh, that translates to something like uh, the measuring the wall. And what he did is he did a photo series covering the entire wall in Berlin. Uh, back in the day, of course, Berlin was divided in west and east, and there was a wall that was 27 kilometers long. And Philip told me it were more than 1,100 photos he took, so he basically walked the whole distance uh, and took a shot and then a few meters further on the next shot, etc, etc. So he had the entire wall covered in, with his photos. And then he made a, a video installation, sort of. Uh, back then, video screens were 4x3 format, not 16x9 uh, like we have today. So that was an exact match for the 6x4.5 uh, magazine of this camera. So that's what he used. Um, I put the link to this project in the description of this video below. Check it out. It's a super, super interesting uh, project. And here I've got uh, the book uh, from Philip Bösel and Burkhard Maus. Actually, it was a co-production of two Cologne-based photographers. Um, and as you see, it's got all the, all the pictures of the Berlin Wall they just, you see, they match. It's a documentation of 18 kilometers of Berlin Wall. And uh, again, this project was made in 1984 when they traveled to Berlin, um, uh, the Oval year. And it comprises of 1,144 images. And with this book that was issued 30 years later, uh, in 2014, uh, which uh, with each of these prints comes one um, print of a photo, like this, uh, scanned from the Rollerflex SLX uh, negative, and uh, each book comes with a different print. So each book is a, a unique pro a unique book, and. Uh, I think you can still pick these books up. Some are still available, but not many, maybe. Very, very cool project. 18.3 uh, kilometers of the Berlin Wall in the Oval year of Of course, you will always compare this camera to the Hasselblad, uh, most likely the 500 series, or maybe even the 200. But uh, the question is, which one would you want to buy? There are some small downsides of this camera. Number one, it's really heavy. This setup, as I have it in my hand, is almost two kilograms, and the Hasselblad is maybe four or five hundred grams less uh, if you are using a similar setup. Number two, the Bellows focusing unit itself works splendid but as you see the whole mechanism is just on this one arm this is the support from one side and it holds the whole thing so 
in a very heavy use, uh, it can go out of alignment. And um, these cameras were made until uh, since 1966, so there are some cameras out there uh, that have problems with the alignment of this thing. And then it reads to be very, uh, it's complex to fix. And um, number three, as I said before, flash sync is very slow. So if you want to shoot flash, uh, go Hasselblad 500, very obviously. Apart from that, uh, I think this camera is made for people that appreciate the high craftsmanship and quality. So it's kind of a connoisseur camera. Maybe that's uh, the reason why these cameras didn't pick up that much in prices yet. Whereas uh, Hasselblads get more expensive and expensive these days. People are looking for analog cameras, you know it. Uh, but these Rollerflex SL66 series uh, didn't go up in price so far. Time for the verdict, and as always, <laughs> my standard sentence, uh, my standard statement: it, it's hard to judge a classic camera. Um, this is not all uh, about facts, you know. We are not talking Sony or Nikon digital cameras here. This is a masterpiece of mechanical camera design. If you appreciate that, this camera is for you. From a user point of view. As I said before, it's a bit heavy, it can be a little bit delicate with this uh, focusing mechanism. Uh, make sure when you buy that the camera is in a very good condition. The good thing is, by the way, they were made in Germany until 1992, so people that uh, uh, can service them are still around. So um, it is serviceable, that's good. Overall, uh, there are other options. Uh, personally, I would rather go Hasselblad and uh, well, very personally, I shoot a uh, Rolleicord cord because that's so much more lightweight. But that's, of course, not a system camera. You lose the interchangeable lenses and everything. So, um, highly recommend it for those in the know who want this camera. Uh, if you're in general looking for a 6x6 camera, I think there are other options that might be a little bit more practical. And by the way, one other uh, honorable mention goes to the Mamiya C series. So check my review of the C330. Uh, I think that's actually a pretty underrated camera. They are sort of cheap to get. Uh, they have interchangeable lenses. They are not, they are less heavy than this. They're super sturdy and robust. Maybe they are also interesting. So, yeah, that's it for today. I hope you liked it and enjoyed it, and if you did so, then please leave a like, uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so yet. It's a great, great support. I really appreciate that. If you've got any questions or comments, either to this camera or also maybe to Philip Bussel's uh, project, write something in the comment section below. I love to read all your comments. I will happily answer every single one of them. You know that. Uh, so I hope you have a great time, live long and prosper, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.